pieces. What was your group? Okay. Were the futurists. 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 Futurist. 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 Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna start a, uh, the presentation like this now. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're talking. Our our topic is uh, extra medium. So, why is this our topic? What does it mean? Right. So the idea is that um, it's very easy to find the the kind of the the, the the extremes of size in terms of like extra like you know extra small. You know, you we all know what that means in terms of when when it's in uh, within context or extra large. We know we all know what that means within context. But then in terms of size, like what is an extra medium thing? What is something that is dedicated to um, finding the core of you know whatever you're talking about, whether it's size or as or an idea, whatever it is, right? So that is the, so that is the question. So what is so what 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 is it that we're talking about? Because right now um, the way that we see um, what, how we've been talking about originality and curiosity and also about um, I guess. Uh, Originality mainly is that uh, originality has been kind of rewarded in this in this sense where um, if you can show like a, there's like all of these buildings and all of these things have been kind of lauded as being very original, being very um, kind of uh, just at the forefront of kind of architectural exploration, right? So if you think about um, architectural exploration as a as a frontier, right? So all of these buildings are the frontier, right? So just think about it as the expansion of the United States. So how it was colonized and where was the, where was the frontier? So the frontier people were expanding to the west, and then we continue to expand to the west until you get to the coast. And then so what happens when you get to the coast? You you know all of the resources that you that you went through on your tra on your travel on your trip. But so basically everything is more or less explored. And then when you get to the coast, then you have no other option but to kind of expand inwardly. So you have to try to go and find resources and try to expand your knowledge and expand all of the things that you, that, that you uh, think about towards the places where you more or less have been. So you have to go and find new, new ways of doing this, right? So. so our argument is that we now live in a banality of excess and speculation. We are exhausted. We no longer subscribe to the ideal of the frontier in the production of architecture and images. The current ideal of the frontier is derived from the proliferation of images that saturates the media that ultimately desensitizes us. We denounce the promise of the frontier, the promise of originality. We want to abolish the institutions of architecture and criticism in media that verifies the problem of the promise. We need to rid of measures of what the frontier is or the existence of it only in the silence that we can once again see the essentials. Like the inward expansion after the end of the frontier, it is time to look for new resources and nourishments for architecture, to look for a new lens to measure it, to qualify its production. Can we revisit the street bench, the driveway, the seesaw, the fire hose, the drive-through, Applebee's, and the rain pipe? In conclusion, the extra medium doesn't dismiss innovation or experimentation. The existing notions of creativity will not cease so easily. As we have concluded our own architectural manifest destiny, it is, our nece it is necessary for our field to recollect ourselves and our theories and reapply them to the spaces that we so readily left behind. Originality as an idea is not on trial. We require a reinvented notion of originality in order to create a new, unwavering criticality of architecture that no longer exists in the margins but is spread evenly throughout. <laughs> yeah, I guess we could talk about it. We could talk. We could go through our cat. If we could do. Want to show you about the cat, perhaps? Well, we can talk a little bit about the notion of originality and how, uh, like, what is being considered as original now, and what, like, why, um, why we should revisit what is being considered original. You know, why is the why why are the things that are on the periphery of. Uh, of uh, exploration, the consider what's original. What's uh, you know why why can we can, can do we need a shift on what we consider original? Do we need to maybe look to other things for originality? Well, why is why is originality effective? Yeah, well, why is it why is that the objective? Why why are we all being told to be original all the time? You know, that's 
is the chairman, that's what this is. Right. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was a his, I think, a historical argument that an originality is pushing you into the next realm. It's always pushing you into the next ism, and you're going from one ism to the next. And I think now that we're talking about this frontier and this limit of the margin, I think now we have repercussions of what this originality is doing in terms of either the sensitization of the field and the sensitization of image and of uh, production. I guess in informally it could be it could be it could be almost talked about how pretty much any shape can be built um, and you know geometric, geometrically any any shape that you can imagine could potentially be built. Um, so what happens then? Right. So because that was up from here, we, we, you can't build stuff, but now that is no longer from here. Uh, uh, you know. So then, so where do we go from that? Like where is originality after that has been kind of exhausted? Your contrast for me is clear. Your target, uh, your target is a dissolution. It still seems to be a bit contrast. So, I can make a comment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so part of the, the issue, and I guess one, one of the things we want to get from this exercise, and maybe this is something y'all will be chatting about then, um, or you know, discussing in sort of post uh, curatic uh, assessment of this exercise, and I think it's been you know, it's proven itself is really productive. But I would say you know the issue is how do you generate out of those out of that cap, um, and uh, so because you have to notice. What the cat does is, is, is it's suggested, right? It's a prompt. So, uh, so each of the categories, and I'm going to talk specifically about your analogy, um, uh, is you do an inventory of it. And I think this is what a lot of your presentation was, an inventory of the analogy, which is the frontier as a, as a kind of figure or metaphor uh, organizing you know, a lot of the behavior of, of our society. And in fact, we know that, uh, that, that this actually has the status of a myth. This, that in, in, the, in the modern structuralist sense, not in some you know, superficial sense of a false belief, but rather it's ideological, even metaphysical, that certainly the United States of America has had this fundamental mythology is out of the frontier, and we use it constantly, frontiers of space, even like when we ran out of, we got the ocean, ran out of geographic space, we, we, the next frontier, the new frontier was outer space, so like, hey, we're not stopping, we need four more planet Earths to, to provide our materials, let's go, let's go find them. Uh, so, but what I would say is the way, uh, and, and this happens to be one dear to my heart, partly because I grew up in the frontier, I mean the West, which is still loaded, where, where literally that mythology is real, it's not some metaphor, not some image on a movie screen, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but it, what, I, what I looked at, and actually in the book Heretics, um, uh, well, I guess I did it. In, it was actually in Miami Virtual, and I can send you the link on that. But I used I used the metaphor myself. I, I, I did a critique or a deconstruction of of the use of frontier as a as a metaphor for cyberspace and for the internet because you keep talking about the internet, and cyberspace as a new frontier. You go out there, and it's like the wild west on Second Life, and and who knows what sort of a you know big busted you know two headed dragon you're going to run to run into, and it's some it's some kid in the basement somewhere actually. Um, <coughs> But, uh, but what, so what you need though is, so what the analogy suggests is we need a, we need a, in a way your analogy there, you're moving away from this, it's part of your contrast. That's what you're looking for is we'll say, well, we need the equivalent of that. Where, where it becomes suggested was we say, is there some other feature of American life? Because mythology has to come innately, it has to be, it has to be native to the civilization for it to be persuasive, for it to move as a kind of meme or to become viral, so to speak. Um, and so when I looked in that, in one of the seminars that I did a few years back that was the basis for uh, the Influence Miami Virtue, that project, was, uh, the, was to look for another mythology. That is, you can, in a sense, can it, is it possible to craft at the level of mythology? And, and partly, I think what you're saying is, is, is what is the mythology that's going to guide uh, architecture, uh, you know, to, to make it address the needs uh, and the beliefs and the practices of the civilization? And... The other, um, the other basis for mythology that, that we came up with that's native to America is the blues. 
So there's quite a different model of behavior uh, that you're that I think is is part of the desire and the impetus of your argument uh, is the blues, and especially as it's then developed into jazz, and and of course in blues and jazz is you know is is the uh, North American version, but there's in in terms of the the sort of uh, Black Atlantic or the whole Creole spread of the colonial post-colonial era. Um, I mean, Brazil has a version of this. I mean, Argentina has a version of it, uh, but but there are actually ancient versions as well. At Larca called uh, Duende. It's another kind of mood, completely another kind of atmosphere. Not not of conquering space, but of of uh, a collaboration, cooperation. So you might think of the jazz group as a model of a cooperation, uh, which is uh, gives you a suggestive and collaboration, which gives you a, a suggestive model that could be. Uh, uh, in you know, developed further as a as a design guide, but also as a way to think about you know what sort of cities do we want to build? Cities of cooperation rather than cities of conquest um, uh, or front, you know frontier. So I wonder about that as a uh, as a, a suggestion, and I think specifically I'm thinking about the kind of attitude that goes with that. So like the uh, like the the if we said if we name the emotional experience of jazz, people described it, you know, blues as a feeling about the world, blues is, uh, is glad to be feeling sad. That is, that's a, that, that notion of, of, uh, of a certain kind of, of joy is, it's, it's what you, it's not, it's not the, the bad things, it's what you do about the bad things. It's a certain attitude towards the problems of the world in which you celebrate with, um, uh, but with the power of music to heal, uh, to transform, to create a sense of community and give a sense of purpose. So that might be, we might say, what, what is uh, the architecture of jazz? Would be, the, would be the way you make your analogy more, uh, more productive. And, uh, I mean, that would interrogate the trope of the kind of idiosyncratic building that tries to wave its arms and say, you know, I am. Also, the, the trope of individual crea creativity, each building is one office, and so collaborative creativity. So the, the turning back of all of the um, expressivism and the planting of flags of the territorialization of, of the space and the turning back. And again, yeah, if you find the right analogy, you've got an amazing interrogation. So what, what is the next logic beyond this one? Necessary turning back and collaborative creativity through architecture. What is the uh, what, what will the buildings sort of be? Um, whether that's original thinking, maybe you know, not in that heroic way, but in a, in a much more quiet way, inexpressive way. Great. Um, how about the other, the other sort of contrast? Is, is there the analogy Greg suggested? A very good one, Philip. Um, theory. Who's your theorist? And I, I think in, in, in your cat, uh, Greg, if I, you're, you're generally uh, encouraging that people take an existing model, be it a building, a, a theorist, a, a body of work that can be uh, extended or reacted against, but it's there. It's something that you, you, you can rely on. You're not inventing it. You're constructing off it. Yeah? Right. And as a helpful means, a helpful pedagogical tool. Somebody's already, some deep thinker has already sort of given you something um, that you can, you can react to instead of trying to pull it out of your ass. You know? Right, the theorist says, the theorist already, what it, the power of theory is the power of generalization. So the theorist is already saying, this is how the world is. I mean, it's giving a very, very large claim about the nature of, of you know, how everything works, language, meaning, you know, politics, ethics. Uh, and so then you say, well, if that's true, if that's the case, uh, it's just like when I took Derrida, and he said, well, we need a linguistics of Finnegan's Wake, not a Finnegan's Wake, not a, not an analytical, uh, you know, univocal symbolic logic. What would be the consequences of that for supporting, uh, you know, where where language would take us and, and powers of inference? So like, well, let me see if that's true. Let me try that. <clears throat> what I would say with the cat <clears throat> that's listed here, in fact, most of the cats is I haven't seen. Uh, a theory, uh, and, and I think, Mark, what you're saying is the way, the way it translates into architecture is it doesn't have to be a philosophical uh, position. It can be uh, a precedent in architecture. Uh, so like when some, like the, the folks that referred to Shumi and Kuhas, 
that that could be a theory. Um, but what seemed to be actually the theory in, in the front in the futurist one was was actually the the manifest destiny argument, which was it was positioned in the analogy. But and, and the analogy was actually being used as a contrast. So it's like, oh, we got our categories are all slipping around. Uh, but so you'd want to see, you'd want to to get the power of the thing. And that's what I'm saying. The beauty of, of the cat is just as a pedagogical device or as a or as a prompt for creativity is you don't have to do the thinking. That's that's like you know Greyhound bus. Leave the driving to us. I mean, you give it over to the cool house. You give it over to you know the blues and stuff. And say, well, let me let me just see what they. Let me just receive from them what they might suggest, and then I'll cobble it together in some way, and then and then take over. You know, like let me take the controls again. Uh, from you, but but let let the cat do some of the work for you, and and I think some of you are all putting too much responsibility of, like you said, being original. Like, uh, let me generate this out of whole cloth. Let me have a thing that pop out of my head, you know, and, and give us the Apollonian. Uh, doesn't work, you know. That's way too hard, at least banality ultimately, because it's too hard to think, you know, without your disciplined cap. Uh, so, I, but I didn't see, and I think that's the right question. What's the precedent here? That you know gives us an inventory of possibilities uh, that we can then generate from. And I, I mean, I, I'd say in general, the thesis here has been uh, overarchingly ambitious uh, problem solving. And so many of the theses kind of try to address Chinese identity, or you know, I am interested in Chinese identity, and they construct this city or something. And it, it, it just strikes me that it's a very, very difficult form of learning because you're, you're inventing it from one part to the It's far, uh, far easier to take on something locally with, with reference to things that are already established. And, and work and to a point of originality or, or whatever, you test the term originality. I actually think you're looking for an original mode contemporary architecture that contests absolutely the smorgasbord of shapeliness that's out there. Um, but, but perhaps you, you know, to all of you, are, I think if I'm trying to suggest anything in this thesis prep, it's that you allow yourselves to take a, a local thing and kind of interrogate it deeper rather than trying to sort of put your banner up and, and, and create it yourself, which is very difficult and usually flounders. It's very difficult to be uh, incisive uh, without, without you know, using other, other points of decision. Yeah. In, in your, with your students, Greg, do you, do you have a similar kind of thing? They, they want to write Finnegan's Wake day one. What, what are you having? Are they doing, they're doing creative writing? Well, so my students, uh, you know, the problem of, of teaching heuretics and, and the humanities and liberal arts is, um, you know, the, the assumption and the expectation of the students there is to do thesis all the time, nothing but thesis. Uh, in, in architecture, the little problem is like, you're, you're, so like you're coming to writing as like, oh, wait, what am I supposed to write? Well, in, in, in the humanities and liberal arts, is like, what, I'm supposed to make something? I'm supposed to create something? What? No, I'm going to critique it. I'm going to like blow it out of the water. I'm going to problematize it. Uh, I mean, in my graduate seminar right now, we're trying to invent a, uh, an electrate metaphysics uh, and a, a discourse on method, which requires them not only to theoretically argue for the necessity of what such a thing could be, but also to perform it to some extent, at least partly, in you know, in a blog medium, using imaging capacities of sort of a low end, but you know, Photoshop and and you know, various you know, diagrams and visualizing and so forth and. Uh, uh, so, so we just had a session last week where they're they're you know we're trying to use the cat and they're they're saying now we need to you know we need to maybe Aristotle as a model for Western metaphysics maybe we we need to step back and critique that is that really true and so forth or we're, we're reading a book on uh, by Francois Julien uh, called the propensity of things on on Chinese metaphysics I say well what about African metaphysics what about what about India you know it's like what about Africa? I say, geez, let's just, you know, but the idea of, the, of heuretics is it's it's not uh, an attempt to have a holistic critique. It's to say, and, and it's, it's funny, it's like, it, it, 
when you read any book on creativity or you, you know any any suggestions about how creativity works, you say, well, the biggest problem in creativity is to spend your internal your internal critic. Your internal critic is saying, well, what about what about India? You know, or in, internal critic saying, what about the product? You know, what if I have to make a living here and these kind of things? Just suspend that for the moment. And then, you know, you, you, don't, you don't give up your judgment, you suspend the critic for a moment and you say, I'm going to make an experiment, you know, I'm going to, with these features of the cat, I'm just going to see what I can do. I'm going to use it as a prompt to, um, uh, to help me generate thinking that will get me back to a place where I can be productive and practical and reasonable. Uh, so, like I said, in my field, it's like, what my students are really good at is, you know, and any student in liberal arts are really good at is like, let's problematize this, let's parse it out, let's do a critique, let's undermine it, you know, let's deconstruct it. Uh, and I'm saying, no, just take, you know, just take this, uh, you know, and see what you can make it do. And then the critique will be, if it's stupid, if it doesn't help you, if it doesn't generate interesting uh, material, throw it out, put something else in there, you know. Like we're reading Lacan's, you know, Seminar 11, uh, where he introduces the notion of the gaze, and you know, because it's a model of, 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 of space and time that, that, in fact, doesn't depend upon seeing. I was really reminded of it with, you know, the presentations today. Uh, is precisely a critique of the idea that's based everything based on looking and seeing, and say, well, actually, there's another force uh, called the gaze, which is organizing your behavior, which has nothing to do with sight. It has everything to do with desire and drive, and these, you know, these these forces, like we're saying, of the part object. Uh, is that useful? Is that productive? I think it's enormously productive in a society of spectacle and in conditions of surveillance, uh, because it's really an account of how we surveil ourselves. You know what Foucault called the disciplinary uh, society. Uh, but it, you know, is that productive? That's the critique. It's not like, well, what about it? is you know psychoanalysis, you know, anti-feminine, or you know, is it is it you know patriarchal, or I don't know. It's like eh, maybe so. I don't know, but like let's just see what we can make it do. And I think that's the attitude you want to take. It's very experimental in that sense. So you imagine experimental um, architecture. And when I think about architecture, it's loaded with unbuildable projects. Uh, not just because they don't win the competition or they aren't fundable, but it just seems to me like architects like blue sky at a lot more than some other sort of fields do. Uh, so, but yeah, that's but that's the idea is like how to you know it's not that we don't want to be productive in a practical way, but we have to creativity requires some taking off of the binders and the bonds and the fetters and allowing your imagination to play around a little bit to see what the possibilities are. Yeah, and I, and I think as they approach thesis, that to, to a large extent, that's done for them in the studio because it's, there's a sort of uh, there's a setup and an expectation of production. Often, often the production is prescribed. In thesis, you're really having to do that for yourself. And so if you can't take those binders off, if you can't get over the hump of your own doubt and sort of critiquing things like oh, what did blah, 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 then then you never get into it. And so, yeah, you know, I think it's great advice that you. You, you allow something like this to just instigate things, and you start them, and you judge them, and, and if it doesn't work, you do something else. But at least you're into it, and you're starting to to, to be productive. Right, and it's, it's not just. And the other thing I like about the fact that there are these four, even five ingredients, or you know, uh, resources that are put into the into the system, kind of like a, a complex catastrophe theory. Like, well, what are the you know, what are the sources that have to be, you know, integrated, uh, is you're not just saying, well, I'm just going to do another, I'm just going to be Kuhaus writ small, you know, but rather you say, well, yeah, I'm using Kuhaus, uh, I liked what he did, you know, with uh, Coney Island there, but then you're going to juxtapose that with, well, what about, you know, a blues mythology, and what about, you know, a mystical experience, uh, and, and so forth, and then when you put those together, what comes out is, you know, not a cool house, it comes out pretty original, even though uh, its resources are all given. But the originality is emergent. It's really, it really corresponds to our notions of complexity theory, which is to say the new stuff isn't at the some origins, you know, in the beginning was originality, but rather it's like, well, in, in the beginning was all this stuff was already given. I mean, that's actually the Western, you know, the notion of chaos. It doesn't come out of nothing. Uh, it comes out of the apiron or whatever, which is the, with the mix of everything. Uh, and then, but in the emergent way, when these things are 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 inter interconnected, the newness is in the is an, is emergent. 
you know, it's uh, in that sense of complexity theory. It's not, it's not foreseeable, and yet it's generated out of the given. That, that seems to be the mystery of creativity is, is how that happens. And what I'm arguing with theoretics is to say it happens with a process. It happens with a method just the same way analysis does. We know that, al that analysis is totally systematic. Um, but another thing I, I want to say, and this is really a question for you, Mark, or your experience with your students, it seems to me that there's almost an algorithmic nature to the cat. I mean, the cat is more heuristic than that, than a parametric design. But still, there's sort of al it's algorithmic in that you have these inputs, and then you run them, in a way. And it seems like it's sort of algorithmic, maybe. It's not systematically sequential, but it's, it, it's, it's sort of parametric, I think. Is that too loose a metaphor? I think that's absolutely what it is. It's a little instigating device. It's a little motor. And you're, you're feeding things into it and seeing what you get. Yeah. Um, well, I hope, it, I hope it's useful. It's not as if uh, this isn't a course where I'm, I'm sort of mandating that they, they take it and use it. It's, uh, it's a, simply a, a way of alerting them to somebody like yourself who's, who's thought through theory of method and is suggesting you've got to go to use um, and, and if it's helpful, they, they work with it, and if it's not, of course they don't. It's, the, it's, it's your work in the end. But I hope it gives you some sort of context for you know, understanding. So next, next week, Greg, if we, um, I'd love to have you to address the sort of predetermined drives and my story, which I think is, is another very interesting thing here, because suddenly <coughs> people have to produce their own piece of work uh, within a tradition in which if you ever sort of say, I like this, you're killed <laughs> completely. I mean, we, we have, uh, it's very, it's a very odd thing in architecture schools that you both encourage individual work and any, uh, any fallback to an individual justification is kind of killed, not being abstract and conceptual enough. And yet, you know, where do you, where do you get pieces from? Where is the, the drive and the taste and the selection? Um, where, where does it all come from? And I've enjoyed your sort of counterpointing the, the, the grand literate tradition by beginning to emphasize this as a, as a very important part of intellection and of invention. Um, but and doing so not in a loose way, not so that anything goes because you like it, but, but actually a very thoughtful way. And I, I, know, I know normally you spend a semester with students thinking this through until they get to that point of epiphany, as it, as it were. Um, but uh, if you could introduce that, that idea, I think it, it again may be a very helpful one as they approach thesis. It's a structuring of, of, uh, of personal drive. Absolutely. No, that would be, uh, I look forward to doing that. Uh, and you and I can, off list, we can you know, email a little bit more about that. But uh, I would love to do that. Yeah. So next week, say, uh, 10 o'clock again? Yes, perfect. <coughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. This is great. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you. Good work. Good work. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Take care. I'll catch up with you later.